Hi, I'm Sean Munger, historian, author, teacher, and podcaster. On my website, seanmunger.com, where I teach history classes online, I'm offering a comprehensive audio course on the history of conspiracy theories in America. This class seeks to give a historical context and dive into the deep background of how and why conspiracy belief became so ingrained in American society, and how we got to the place that we are now, where conspiracy theories and their believers are threatening the basis of American democracy itself, such as we recently saw with the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. The course consists of eight chapters. I've decided to put two of those eight here on YouTube for free as a teaser to demonstrate what the course is like. I previously put chapter two online. This one is chapter five, which is called The Age of Wu, Conspiracy Theories in the 1980s and 90s. This chapter begins in 1980 with the election of Ronald Reagan and the moral panic of SRA, Satanic Ritual Abuse, which can be traced back to a single book and which became a foundational text for today's QAnon conspiracy cult. We'll also deal with UFO, New Age, and militia anti-government conspiracies, including the Oklahoma City bombing, Art Bell and the Heaven's Gate debacle, the X-Files, the influence of David Icke and his repackaging of legacy conspiracy theories into a science fiction context, and the extremely formative period of 1997 to 2001. The link to sign up to the class is in the description to this video. The course is $25, but you can also get it for signing up to access all my courses for $5 a month. This is an audio-only course, so the video images are mostly placeholders, but I hope from this you'll be able to get a sense of what the whole course is like. So now here's Chapter 5 of the Conspiracy Theories in America course. Welcome back to our audio course on Conspiracy Theories in America. I'm Dr. Munger. We're on Session 5, which will profile the history of conspiracy theories in the 1980s and 90s, roughly from the election of Ronald Reagan up to the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. We left off in a unique moment of fear and gloom among Americans. In many ways, 1980 was the lowest the country had sunk in its entire history up to that point, at least in the lifetimes of the people alive then. Recession, stagflation, oil and energy crises, the intensifying of the Cold War, high crime, urban decay, and the year-long agony of the Iranian hostage crisis that President Jimmy Carter couldn't seem to resolve. Ronald Reagan, the conservative former movie actor and governor of California, rode this wave of fear and resentment to the White House in 1980, but he also got there through a message of hope that America's fortunes would turn around if he got into office. Reagan's accession as U.S. president in many ways served as a rebuke to the tumultuous social changes of the previous decade and a half. But some things did not change. That undercurrent of fear seemed to get worse, especially as the Cold War reached its late peak, in part because of Reagan's policy of sharp confrontation with the Soviets in military spending and especially in the deployment of intermediate-range nuclear missiles in Europe in the early 1980s. Many Americans assumed that nuclear annihilation was more or less inevitable. It was just a question of when and what might touch it off. Conspiracy theories in the 1980s, early 1980s, started to pull away from the strictly political context that had characterized them since the Kennedy assassination, and they started to touch other concerns. One of the most important conspiracy theory vectors in this period, and one of the most devastating, was a book published in 1980 called Michelle Remembers, written by Michelle Smith and Lawrence Pazder. The importance of Michelle Remembers in the history of conspiracy theories in America is virtually impossible to overstate. Though published in 1980 and associated most strongly with the moral panic of SRA, or Satanic Ritual Abuse, this book was one of the foundational mythologies of the QAnon conspiracy cult of the 2010s and 20s. Ostensibly, this book is the memoir of a woman, Michelle Smith, who was, an, as an adult, under the care of her psychologist, Lawrence Pazder, the book's co-author, recovered, she recovered formerly repressed memories 
of a horrific cycle of child abuse she claims to have suffered in the 1950s in Vancouver, Canada. Her descriptions of these rituals made clear that her abusers were Satanists, motivated by the occult, and that they had a powerful cabal that could conceal their activities. It was pure conspiracy theory narrative and eerily similar to nothing so much as the blood libel conspiracies of medieval Europe. There was nothing true about Michelle Remembers, but despite being debunked and refuted pretty much immediately upon its publication, the debunkings, as is true with most conspiracy theories, never went as far as the original allegations. Michelle Remembers was such a sensation, and it scared the hell out of parents, that they began seeing signs of satanic ritual abuse everywhere they looked. It was a classic example of a moral panic. As ridiculous as the allegations of satanic ritual abuse were, and as little evidence as there was to support them, unfortunately this conspiracy theory destroyed numerous lives. The most prominent example was a series of criminal charges and lawsuits raised in California against the operators of a daycare center, the McMartin Preschool. Flimsy allegations against one person, made by a woman later revealed to have been mentally ill at the time, were inflamed by totally unethical interrogations of very young children who were coached by their interrogators to say that staff members at McMartin abused them. Lawrence Pazder, the co-author of Michelle Remembers, was actually a consultant to the lawyers representing the parents of some of the children making allegations. No one was convicted in the McMartin preschool case, but the lives of the accused were ruined just the same. One of them spent five years in prison awaiting various trials and retrials, despite never having been found guilty. The tale of Michelle Remembers was long. TV talk show host Oprah Winfrey had Lawrence Pazder and Michelle Smith on her program in 1989 to repeat more or less uncritically their conspiracy theories about satanic ritual abuse, despite the fact that they had been refuted nine years before. The media could not get enough of SRA. Many parents, especially of small kids, believed the conspiracy theory or acted as if they did, better safe than sorry when it comes to protecting children. Elsewhere in America, another forest of conspiracy theories grew up around the anti-government militia movement, which gained popularity in the 1980s and 1990s. Fears of imminent nuclear war, which were at their height in 1982 and 83, drove small groups of people to form breakaway communities and to build bunkers where they hoped to wait out the coming nuclear apocalypse. Such groups tended to be right-wing in political orientation, terrified especially of federal and state attempts to control access to firearms. Groups that didn't go to such extremes as building bunkers often deployed mythologies that trafficked heavily in conspiracy theories. The sovereign citizen movement, related closely to the tax protest movement, built a mythology around the idea, a conspiracy theory, that legitimate constitutional government in the United States had been secretly overthrown in the 1930s, and that some sort of corporatist or military government had been in charge since then. Much of this delusion was formed by a desire to reach an explanation for why paying taxes was somehow optional. Members of the sovereign citizen movement, often middle-aged or elderly white men, bought into an elaborate web of fake explanations about how laws supposedly worked, and how this or that magic legal talisman would have an outsized effect that would nullify a person's obligation to pay taxes or zero out their debt or something. One subset of the conspiracy underground we haven't discussed yet involves UFOs and aliens. The history of UFO belief is extremely complicated, and we don't have time to go into it. Suffice it to say that mythologies surrounding unidentified flying objects had begun developing in earnest since the late 1940s and quickly adopted conspiracy theories as part of their worldview, usually the idea that the U.S. government was covering up the reality or existence of extraterrestrial visitors to Earth. UFO lore resided comfortably in the segment of counterculture that we could call New Age, which arose out of some belief systems not necessarily conspiratorial, that grew up in the upheaval of the 60s and 70s. New Age is hard to define, but generally you know it when you see it. 
crystals, pyramids, Ouija boards, and tarot cards, Wicca, channeling, out-of-body experiences, that's all new age. A good example of this phenomenon, and one that overlaps considerably with conspiracy beliefs, is the movement that grew up around Washington State mystic Jay-Z Knight, who founded the Ramtha School of Enlightenment in 1987. Knight claimed to be channeling the spirit of a 35,000-year-old caveman named Ramtha who was passing ancient secrets of life and spirituality onto the modern world. Ramtha was and is both a financial scam and a cult. The line between conspiracy theories, cults, and financial scams becomes increasingly blurry in this period, as we'll see, and it's sometimes difficult to judge the sincerity of professed believers in specific conspiracy narratives. New Age and UFO-related topics brings us to another prominent personality in our overall story, and one perhaps familiar to many people listening to this class, Art Bell, host of the popular Coast to Coast AM radio program. Arthur Bell, born in North Carolina, had a relatively unremarkable career as a radio host and disc jockey before transitioning to political talk radio beginning in 1978. Talk radio boomed after the Reagan administration allowed the FCC's Fairness Doctrine, which required more or less ideological balance when discussing public political topics on public airwaves. They allowed that to lapse in 1987. In 1988, right after this happened, Bell began his Coast to Coast AM program broadcasting from Nevada and was picked up for syndication. At first, he discussed political topics and conspiracy theories, especially those involving guns and gun control, catering to that anti-government militia movement I was talking about earlier. In 1995, Timothy McVeigh, a member of this anti-government militia movement, committed a heinous terrorist attack against the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. A truck bomb similar in design to the weapon used by al-Qaeda connected Islamist militants against the World Trade Center in New York in February 1993 blew up and killed 168 people. McVeigh planned the attack on April 19th, the second anniversary of the day federal agents raided the Waco, Texas compound of the Branch Davidian cult headed by former evangelical preacher David Koresh. The Waco siege of 1993 was a galvanizing moment for the militia movement. That, as well as a previous violent standoff against anti-government militant Randy Weaver at Ruby Ridge, Montana in 1992, convinced many militants that it was time for violent action against the government. McVeigh was partially radicalized by a racist novel called The Turner Diaries, an explicitly pro-Nazi and white supremacist fantasy that had been circulating in the far-right underground since the late 1970s. McVeigh was executed in 2001, a few months before 9-11. After Oklahoma City, the syndicators of Art Bell's show didn't want to be associated with the far-right militia movement that had hatched McVeigh, so he began to pivot to less politically controversial, but still highly conspiratorial topics— UFOs and aliens and alleged government cover-ups about them were a mainstay of his Coast to Coast AM program for the remainder of the 1990s and up until his retirement in the 2000s. In the early 2000s, Bell co-authored a book, the wildly inaccurate global warming novel The Coming Global Superstorm, with Whitley Strieber, a former horror writer, who in 1985 began claiming that he'd been serially abducted by extraterrestrials for most of his lifetime, and that his body had been implanted with alien surveillance devices. Strieber can be identified heavily with the New Age movement, but he too trafficked in conspiracy theories, especially those related to UFOs and aliens. The Coming Global Superstorm incidentally was made into a popular film in 2004 called The Day After Tomorrow, It had the unfortunate effect of further distorting public consciousness about the reality of climate change and global warming. For the record, Art Bell died in 2018. Whitley Strieber is still alive, so far as I know. Two other media and pop culture events of this period are worth mentioning. 
The first is Oliver Stone's 1991 film, JFK. Stone, a respected director who won Academy Awards for his Vietnam films Platoon in 1986 and Born on the Fourth of July in 1989, revealed himself to be a deeply committed conspiracy theorist with his next project about the Kennedy assassination. Stone chose as his subject the memoirs of Jim Garrison, the rather unhinged former New Orleans district attorney who brought an unsuccessful case against a local businessman for his alleged involvement in a vast plot to assassinate JFK in 1963. We talked about that in the last session. Despite the fact that Garrison had been largely discredited in the public eye since the failure of that case in 1969, and despite the fact that he was deeply embarrassing even to fellow JFK conspiracy buffs, the factual liberties that Stone took in his film depicting the Garrison case had the effect of rehabilitating Garrison's reputation and introducing JFK conspiracies to a new generation of Americans. JFK, the movie which starred Kevin Costner as Garrison and Oscar winner Joe Pesci in a memorable role, was a big commercial and critical hit. Though factually untenable in nearly every single one of its allegations, the JFK film convinced many people, especially young people, that there had been a conspiracy in the Kennedy assassination. Two years later, in 1993, a television program called The X-Files premiered on the Fox UHF TV network in the United States. Created by Chris Carter, a science fiction writer who was inspired by those conspiracy thrillers I mentioned in the last session, developed a show that had as its mainstay paranormal and UFO subjects and conspiracy theories related to them. One of the first shows to feature long character arcs and multi-season plot developments, The X-Files had one of its main villains, the Cigarette Smoking Man, played by William B. Davis, a shadowy figure who was hinted to be secretly in control of much of the world's political and economic infrastructure. In one episode of the show, the Cigarette Smoking Man is shown masterminding the assassinations of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King. The X-Files was wildly popular and tapped perfectly into the way conspiracy theories were weaving throughout popular culture and public consciousness in the 1990s. Curiously, viewership for The X-Files, which was at its height in the 1997-98 television season, collapsed precipitously after the September 11th attacks of 2001, one of many indications of a major cultural shift surrounding that event, which we'll talk about. In many ways, the period between 1997 and the September 11th attacks was one of the most crucial in the entire history of conspiracy theories in America. It's worth an in-depth look at what was going on in this brief window of time, because many of these threads connect to other elements of our broader story that become important later. One major incident in this period involved a UFO cult called Heaven's Gate. At the end of March 1997, 39 members of this cult, whose leader was Marshall Applewhite, a former choir director, committed ritual suicide in a Southern California mansion they'd been living in for several years. They chose their moment because they believed a UFO was following in the tail of a comet, Hale Bop, which was then at its closest approach to Earth. They saw suicide as a means of casting off earthly existence and ascending to a spiritual plane with the benevolent aliens flying the UFO an event prophesized in Applewhite's teachings for years. Heaven's Gate's apocalyptic mythology had been building since the early 70s, but it definitely came to a head in the cultural and conspiratorial climate of the late 1990s. Heaven's Gate was one of many sects who saw the approaching turn of the millennium as a looming doomsday, much the same as it had been predicted in the Christian eschatology milieu in the 1970s and 80s, Think back to the late great planet Earth. Art Bell and Whitley Strieber, uh, who I mentioned earlier, had some arguable influence on the Heaven's Gate event. Strieber's mythology had, since the mid-80s, emphasized extraterrestrials as a force for societal transformation on Earth, a transformation that the government and other major institutions wanted to prevent. While on Art Bell's Coast to Coast AM show in early 1997, Strieber made the claim that a UFO was probably following the hale Bob comet and would likely be the moment of quote-unquote contact that he'd been predicting. 
The Heaven's Gate ritual suicide event was clearly an unintended consequence of the conspiracy culture of this time. In 1999, another foundational text of the modern conspiracy movement emerged, but from Britain, not the U.S. David Icke, a former British football star and sometime member of the U.K.'s Green Party, had gotten heavily into the New Age milieu in the 1990s and occasionally appeared on TV talking about alternative medicine and paranormal topics. Then, in 1999, Ike published a book, The Biggest Secret, which articulated the conspiracy theory that the world was secretly controlled by reptilian aliens from the constellation Draco, who have the ability to shapeshift temporarily into human form. Ike identified various world leaders and celebrities as shapeshifting reptilian aliens, including Queen Elizabeth II, former President George H.W. Bush, and for some unfathomable reason, country western recording star Chris Christopherson. In his elaborate mythology about these, these reptilian aliens, sometimes called reptoids, Ike recycled the old protocols of the elders of Zion forgery, claiming that it was actually written about extraterrestrials. Ike insists that it is literally true. Essentially, Ike's belief system repackaged the anti-Semitic Jewish world conspiracy theories in a science fiction shell, substituting reptoid aliens for Jews. Ike heavily relied upon the work of American conspiracy author William Cooper, who brought Illuminati slash New World Order conspiracy theories to a new generation, especially with his book Behold a Pale Horse, published in 1991, which became wildly popular in the conspiracy underground. Ike himself also became popular, taking to the lecture circuit in the 2000s. We'll encounter David Ike periodically again in future sessions. In the year 2000, another conspiracy theory began to arise that has connections to subjects we have or will talk about. Nesara, N-E-S-A-R-A. Nesara is an acronym and it stands for the National Economic Stabilization and Reorganization Act. It was a draft law proposed by a Louisiana engineer, Henry Bernard, who had nothing to do with conspiracies. He was an ordinary citizen who proposed a fundamental reorganization of the American economic and banking system, and he wrote to various politicians asking them to consider sponsoring the Nassara concept. Nassara was picked up by several grifters who already had experience scamming people in the New Age underground. One in particular, a woman named Shaini Goodwin, who lived in a trailer in Washington State and who was a graduate of the Ramtha School of Enlightenment, spun Nassara into both a conspiracy theory and a financial scam, aimed principally at former investors in several high-yield investment scams of the 1990s, especially the Omega scam, with which Goodwin had been involved. According to Goodwin's promotional materials, Desara was not a proposed law, but a real law, secretly passed by the U.S. Congress in 2000, which would have the effect of canceling all debt owed by ordinary Americans and entitling certain people to participation in a prosperity program that would basically give them free money. Proponents of Nesara quickly roped extraterrestrials into the conspiracy theory, holding that benevolent aliens were trying to use Nisara to kick out the corrupt rulers of Earth and bring spiritual rejuvenation to humanity. If it looks to you like these theories and belief systems are becoming increasingly bizarre and outlandish as time goes on, that's because they are. But note how often they reference, repackage, or tie into very old conspiracy theories we've already looked at. Illuminati, secret societies, anti-Semitism, and Jewish world control conspiracies. The final event I'm going to talk about in this period is a lead-in to our next subject. It also introduces a key player in modern conspiracy lore, Austin, Texas radio host Alex Jones, who, as I mentioned in a previous session, is basically the Father Charles Coughlin of the Internet age. Jones, born in Austin in 1974, got his start much as Art Bell did, as a very minor radio personality in a local market. From an early age, however, Jones was deeply steeped in conspiracy lore, 
having fallen for the New World Order conspiracy theory, essentially the Illuminati by another name, in his early childhood. He was also a devotee of William Cooper. In 1995, on his public access radio show, Jones began talking about how the Oklahoma City bombing was a false flag by the U.S. government. The irony here is that Jones had sympathies with the anti-government and far-right militia movements that spawned the real conspiracy behind Oklahoma City. In 1999, Jones was fired from his Austin radio station for refusing to stop talking about conspiracies, which was driving away advertisers. He rebooted his show, but not on radio. He began broadcasting on the internet. By the summer of 2001, Alex Jones had a huge listenership. And unlike Father Coughlin 70 years before, he wasn't relying on public airwaves to disseminate his message. Jones made so many bizarre and repeated claims about government conspiracies that he could spin basically any major national or world event into a prophecy that he supposedly predicted correctly. When the Twin Towers fell on September 11, 2001, that's exactly what he did, and Alex Jones became a major American phenomenon. That's where we're going to pick up next time. This is the end of Session 5 of Conspiracy Theories in America. Thanks for listening. So, I hope that you enjoyed and learned something from this chapter of the Conspiracy Theories in America course. If you're interested in the whole thing, as I said at the beginning, it's available on my website, seanmunger.com, for $25. Or it's included in the package if you sign up to access all of the courses on my site for $5 a month, and you can cancel that at any time. I'm not trying to get rich from this. I'm just trying to share some historical insight and context on some issues that are vitally important to the future of our democracy. So check out some of my other videos here on YouTube, especially my historical thoughts series. And like, subscribe, do all that stuff that you normally do for a video you like. Thanks for watching.